for the dark hours when you dare not close your eyes. Our final tale is entitled The Smell of Gasoline, written and read by Chris Holland. It was 2.32 when the tones woke me up at the station. Damn it, I just dozed off. I slid my boots on and grabbed my radio as I made my way out of the sleeping quarters to the bay where my partner already had the ambulance started. The hot and humid Texas air hit me in the face and fogged up my glasses. We like to keep the sleeping quarters arctic cold, so that tends to happen. I jumped in the truck and my partner gave it the diesel. The voice on the radio told me about the single car accident towards which we were speeding. I was still in the process of shaking the sleep out of my head as I soaked in the details of the chattering radio. Four passengers, fire crew on scene, rollover, additional fire crew requested. Hmm, that's not a good sign. The five minutes it took us to arrive flew by as I tried to get my head out of the sleep deprived fog. As we pulled up to the wreck, I could see the tire marks that spell out the story. The driver probably swerved to dodge an animal, or maybe they were just drunk. This sent the car sliding towards the median. The soft ground let the front rim dig in and catch, sending the car into acrobatics across the oncoming lanes. The car lost momentum and came to a rest wheels down on the shoulder of the opposite side of the road. The fire crew was scrambling to put out the flames that were licking up from the engine. To facilitate the process of getting the fuck out of there with our patient ASAP, we came to a stop as close to the wreck as we safely could. I jumped out and ran over to the back corner of the ambulance to grab our fire jackets, and I see that one of the fire crew already made it to the compartment. He had our fire extinguisher and yelled out to me, Our extinguisher spent, and we're not close enough to a hydrant to pump water, as he turned and raced back towards the growing inferno. The fire crew had already pulled two kids out of the back, and my partner ran over to assess their injuries while I went over to the wreck to see about the two still trapped in the car. The smell of gasoline soaked the air. Hmm, that's not a good sign. By the time I got over to the driver's side, the guy that had taken the extinguisher from the truck had seemed to put out the flames in the engine compartment. I heard him call out, all clear. The driver's side roof had considerable damage. It was caved in a good 12 inches and had to, and I had a bit of a hard time seeing the patient as I walked up. Now, as I was kneeling down to get a better view inside, I could see that the kid had a massive skull depression that matched the roof of the car. His head kind of looked like a pumpkin the day after Halloween when the neighborhood kids had gone around smashing them all for kicks while they were all hopped up on the night's sugar cash. This was the kind of injury that we write up in our reports as injury not compatible with life. Just in case, I reach in and feel his neck for a pulse. Yep, the guy's DRT. Dead right there. I glance over when I hear the girl on the passenger side start to moan. I jumped up and grabbed the airway and trauma bag that I'd throw down beside me in one swift motion as I hustle over to attend to the a lot less dead girl. As I stepped up to the passenger door, she looked up at me. She had curly brown hair and bright blue eyes that I could clearly make out even in the poorly lit roadside conditions. I remember this because it struck me as rather odd how pretty she was in spite of the blood running down the side of her face and the broken glass in her hair. I called out loud and clear to her. My name is Chris and I'm a paramedic. I'm here to take good care of you. Don't move your head. I promise everything will be okay. She cried out back to me. My legs hurt, please, my legs. She was talking, so at least I knew she was breathing. I reached down into my trauma bag and grabbed a collar for her neck. As I stretched my arms around her neck with the collar, I asked her to tell me what happened. There was a deer and my boyfriend almost hit it in uh, my legs. Can you move your legs? No, I think they're stuck. I turned to one of the fire crew and yelled out to him. How long before we can extricate this girl? He yelled back that they had just pulled the jaws of life out of the truck and it would be a five to ten minutes. 
Just then, I heard someone else shout. The engine's burning again! Get back! I stepped back a bit as the white powder shot out at the engine once again. A steady blast was held on the flames until the extinguisher started to sputter out and gave up. Still, there were flames. They kept growing and spreading. Faster now without the white blast to beat them back. The flames crept towards the dashboard while the fire crew scrambled to find another red canister. Where the fuck is the other truck? I heard one of the fire crew curse out as they were forced to stand by watching the time run out. The girl began screaming even before the flames made their way through the dashboard. She flailed against her restraints in a futile attempt to free herself from the death trap. She let out another blood-curdling scream as she locked eyes with me. Save me! She screamed. I tore off my bunker jacket and tried to cover her with it in a last-ditch attempt. I stepped towards the car and thrust my arms in. Just as the flames broke through the dash, I began licking at her legs and belly. My time was cut short by the sting of the flames on my forearm and I instinctively snapped my arms back out of the heat. I had managed to get my fire retardant jacket over her chest, but her face remained exposed to the flames as they crawled up the fabric of her arms. Her screaming became hoarse and guttural as the fire engulfed her. Six men stood around the car, helpless to do a thing, as her screams became muffled and faded away below the growling of the fire. That was three years ago. Since then, things haven't been good for me. Soon after that, I started experiencing visual disturbances. That's what the psych doctors call it, at least. It is a standard procedure after a particularly extreme incident that everyone involved must attend a debriefing. The higher-ups do this to keep an eye on the medics that might crack after seeing something particularly grisly. Most medics handle their shit just fine, but some are more sensitive than others. I usually just go grab a bottle of whiskey and that's all I need. But that incident was different. I didn't mention it during the debriefing, but I had been seeing things since the wreck. It started out subtle. Once I was watching TV and I saw my wife walk across the room into the kitchen out of the corner of my eye. I got up to follow her and pour myself another drink, but when I turned around the corner into the kitchen, I was alone. Another time, I had just arrived home from work when I heard a girl crying upstairs. I ran up thinking my daughter might be hurt, but once again, I was all alone. My wife had taken our daughter shopping with her. Similar things kept happening. I heard voices and saw figures, but nothing was ever there. As these occurrences became more and more frequent, disturbing, I began to question myself. I've never been a superstitious or religious guy, and I like to think of myself as fairly objective. I have been an atheist since I was old enough to reason, and I outright reject the existence of the soul or spirits for that matter. But how could these things be happening? I saw only two explanations. I was either losing my mind, or I was being haunted, but being haunted seemed ridiculous. In my profession, I get to deal with schizos on a fairly regular basis. We are trained how to spot and handle these people. We also have drugs that help with their symptoms, and honestly, I was starting to see some of these schizo symptoms in myself. That probably means they're much worse than I realize. My wife had been begging me to drink less and spend more time with her and our daughter. And I've been holding myself up in my study pretty much any time that I'm at home, attempting to drown out the constant whispers in my ear and hallucinations. In my desperation, I decided to borrow a vial of haloperidol from work. I rarely give the excited and 
highly agitated paranoid schizos this drug to help bring them back to reality and tell the difference between their ideas and the real world. And if I am going schizo, then this drug will make an immediate difference in my mental state. Maybe I can get some rest. Hell, if it works, I'll have a good reason to swallow my pride and go see the doctor. A few nights after I took the vial from work, I was sitting in my study. It was getting late and my wife knocked on the door. I didn't realize it was her at first, so I was kind of startled when I look up and she didn't disappear like all the other figures I see. She had a sad look on her face and she asked if I was going upstairs to bed with her tonight. I told her I just wanted to be alone. At this point she had gotten used to this response and so she just turned and silently walked away. I looked at the vial of haloperidol on the desk and thought to myself, no, not tonight. I called out to my wife. She stepped back into the doorway with a confused look on her face. I forced a smile on my face and I said, Hey babe, I'll be up in about 15 minutes, okay? I love you. She's so beautiful when she smiles. Okay, I love you too, she responded. Then turned and headed upstairs. And I could hear her footsteps all the way up the stairs as she went. Turning back to my desk, I once again trained my focus on the vial. Tonight will be a good night. I dosed myself and chased it with what was left in my glass of whiskey. I leaned back in my chair and waited for the liquid to hit my bloodstream. The minutes ticked by and the whispers melted off into the night and my mind felt clear. It was as if a plastic bag had been pulled off my face and I hadn't even known I was suffocating. For the first time in the last year, all I could hear in the background was the gentle blowing of the air conditioning. Well, that settles it. Tomorrow I'm making a doctor's appointment. I smiled to myself and this time I didn't even have to force it. I took a deep breath through my nostrils and let out a heavy sigh. I picked up a subtle whiff of gasoline in the air. Hmm, that's not a good sign. I stood up and turned to investigate when I saw it. Standing right there where my wife had been in the doorway of the study was a figure. Its face was charred and disfigured. I was frozen in fear. It had no ears, no nose, no eyelids or lips. It stood before me breathing fast and heavy and I could smell burnt flesh. It began to scream in a raspy and hoarse, haunting tone. You just stood there and watched me burn. That was two years ago. I don't remember what happened after I saw the girl. I must have blacked out. The next memory I have after that was waking up in the intensive care unit. I had been badly burnt and I was in a coma for two weeks. I was told that my wife and daughter had died in the fire as my house burnt. When I was well enough, there was a trial, and I was prosecuted for arson and the murder of my wife and daughter. They found me to be mentally incompetent, and since then I've been moved from one facility to another. Eventually, a fire gets started and they move me to another facility. No matter what therapy or drugs I am subjected to, I keep hearing the voice of that girl whispering in my ear. You just stood there and watched. Every time I hear that voice, I wish to myself that I had died in my house that night two years ago. Our sleepless tales have come to an end. Close your eyes. Drift off. And don't look under the bed.